Good morning, Hillside. We are so excited that you are here with us this morning, wherever you're at, wherever you're watching from. We are so blessed that we have the opportunity to come to you live via Facebook, via YouTube. If we haven't met yet, my name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here at Hillside, and I am super excited to be your service host this week. Some things you can expect from our service. We're going to have a great time of worship. We're going to have a time of prayer. Then we're going to spend some time studying God's Word and what it has to say to you and I today. So with that being said, join us for a great time of worship. Make sure you have your coffee, your Bible ready to go. Grab the family, grab a notepad, a pen, and let's start church.
was my cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died for and now my life is yours and I will sing of your goodness forevermore worthy is your name Jesus you deserve the praise worthy is your name worthy is your name Jesus you deserve the praise worthy is your name And now my shame is gone I stand amazed In your love undeniable Your grace goes on and on And I will sing Of your goodness forevermore Worthy is your name Your glory fills this place You alone deserve our praise You're the name above all names Be exalted now in the heavens As your glory fills this place You alone deserve our praise You're the name above all names Be exalted now in the heavens Deserve our praise to the name above all. 
God, we thank you. God, and this morning we declare how great you are. God, we lift high the name of Jesus. The name above all names. The name that every tongue will confess. The name at which every knee will bow. The name of Jesus Christ our Lord. God, you are so good. And you are so great. And God, when we look outside and we see so much hurt and sorrow and loss, it may even seem that you are afar off. But God, we know through your word that you are here. You are with us. Your word tells us that you stick closer than a brother. That you will never leave us nor forsake us. So God, in this moment, when our nation is in so much turmoil, so much division, when our state is suffering so much, God, we don't look at our problems, we don't look at our shortcomings. God, we look and we focus our eyes on you, the great sovereign above it all. So God, we come before you this morning. God, we confess our need of a Savior. God, we confess our sin. We ask your forgiveness. God, we humbly approach you. God, we pray that you would restore. God, we pray that you would heal. God, we pray that you would do what only you can do. And God, as your word says and as you have promised us, that if we humble ourselves and pray, God, that you will hear from heaven and you will heal, heal our land. So God, we pray for healing in our land. God, we pray for safety. We pray for wholeness. We pray for reconciliation. And at the end of it, Lord, we pray and we want and we declare and we receive by declaring it. God, your goodness, your righteousness, your mercy, your grace, your peace, your joy. To God, fill our hearts and lives. So that we, your church, we can rise up and bring the light to the darkness. So God, we thank you that your word says where two or three are gathered in your name. Concerning a matter, God, you are there in our midst. So from here at the Sunnyside campus to you at your living room, maybe the one driving on the road listening to this on a road trip, we come in one accord seeking the face of our Father, our great, great God. God, we love you, we worship you, we praise you in your Son's wonderful and beautiful name, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, Hillside, it's so good to be with you. We serve an amazing God who does amazing things. And he's on the move right now. So I encourage you, if you haven't seen him moving, open your eyes and take a look and see what God's doing in and around us. Well, hey, some, some amazing things that God's doing here at Hillside is a uh, we're doing some amazing, amazing outreach opportunities. This past week, we were able to deliver over four full truckloads of water, Gatorade, granola bars to our Clackamas firefighters here in Damascus. So big shout out to you, Hillside. Big shout out to Casa de Oracion and uh, Pastor Miguel Zapata and the entire family there at Casa de Oracion. Uh, amazing, 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 the body of Christ coming together. We want to encourage us as a fellowship as a body of Christ, to continue in that spirit of generosity. That spirit of generosity can be bringing those items, like at our canned food drive at our last uh, drive-in worship night. We're going to have another drive-in worship night on the 26th of this month. We're going to have some more food being delivered. Be generous there. And we want to continue to be generous and to be faithful and to be obedient in our giving. We as a church... Even though we're not meeting together, we are still operating at full capacity. And part of that operation is reliant and dependent on the faithfulness and the obedience of you, the church 
to bring in the tithe, the first 10% of your increase, to bring it into the storehouse so that we can operate and continue to minister not only to you, not only through the internet, but in all the different ways we are ministering. So we want to encourage you to give in the tithe. But we believe that scripture, we believe Jesus himself encourages us to give above and beyond the tithe. He encourages us to give in alms. Those are those monies that go to help those who are in need, those who are less fortunate. And in our community and in the community surrounding us, many people have been displaced. Many people's homes have been burnt. But we have the opportunity to step up and to help out. And then we want to encourage you to give in missions as well. We as a church, we support over 30 different missionaries. And because of your faithfulness, we are able to continue to do that week in and week out. So come on, Hillside, let's give it up and let's continue to be gracious and generous to the Lord. Amen? Well, amen. Grab your Bibles, grab your pencils, grab some coffee. Pastor Dave's about to bring an amazing word out of the book of Acts as we continue our study, God-sized conversions. God bless you, Hillside. Thank you, Pastor Matt. Hillside, it is good to be with you this morning on a nice September morning, and uh, we've had some crazy weather these last couple of weeks uh, with all of the fires. We continue to pray for families that have been displaced. We're thankful that uh, some of the areas that had been evacuated, they've been able to come back into their homes, and so we are rejoicing. There are still many families that are out of housing and some that have had their homes destroyed. We want to continue to pray with them, pray for them. We want to continue to pray for our men and women that are fighting on the front lines, the Clackamas County Fire Departments and many other fire departments that have come in to assist with the fires that have been going in uh, Clackamas County and beyond. And so literally in the state of Washington, the state of Oregon, and all the way through California. And so we are praying for firefighters. We're praying for families. And we're praying also for the church. This is an opportunity for the church to arise and make a difference. And I want to say thank you to all of our Hillside family for participating in our efforts to uh, supply and provide Gatorades, water, protein bars, granola bars, and other sustaining kinds of snacks for those that are fighting on the front lines. And so thank you. We had three massive truckloads. There were several other churches that participated. Sunnyside Nazarene Church with Pastor Chad Winteringham there. And then also Casa de Aracion, which is Pastor Miguel Zapata. And so we want to say thank you to those two congregations. The leadership there, thank you pastors for your work as we are stronger and better together as we seek to be a blessing in our community. Several other churches have opened their doors even to be a place where uh, folks with RVs or folks that have been evacuated can either store their stuff, uh, their vehicles, or be a place of refuge for them. Uh, Hope City in Milwaukee, as well as Thompson Road Bible Fellowship. And so I want to say thank you to Pastor Brian Becker, as well as uh, uh, Pastor Dan, uh, just doing a great job. So men, thank you uh, for what you're doing in your congregations. Praise God. Well, we continue uh, this morning with our study in the book of Acts, and we are in this mini-series in the midst of this book, and it is God-sized conversions, and we are looking at today Saul to Paul, another roadside conversion. We saw uh, two weeks ago Simon Magus and uh, what was transpiring in his life and what was transpiring as a result and uh, a false conversion. And uh, so I want to encourage you, if you haven't seen that, make sure you watch that and uh, listen to Pastor Matt's message on that. Then last week we looked at the Ethiopian eunuch and the uh, Apostle Paul, or excuse me, the Apostle Philip who went down to, on the road to Gaza and had a radical encounter with a man from Africa and an epic conversion. And so I want to encourage you there. That was our first roadside conversion. Now we're going to have another roadside conversion in uh, who we know now as the Apostle Paul. So as we endeavor in, we're going to be in Acts chapter 9 this morning, and I want to encourage you to have your Bibles with you. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, reading a portion of chapter 9 
Then we're going to also look at a portion uh, from chapter 26. And so let's prepare our hearts. Let's ask God to bless our time together as we look into the perfect law of liberty, the word of God this morning together. Father, will you bless our time as we endeavor into the word? I pray, God, that our hearts would be challenged. I pray, God, that our hearts would be inspired and that, Lord, we would grasp in a greater measure the great commission that God you have assignments you have divine interventions for us and father I believe that even as we saw in Philip's life and we certainly know in the apostle Paul's life that the there's not a single human being on the planet other than Jesus who has had an impact on culture and the kingdom of God than the Apostle Paul. And so, Lord, we know there is divine appointment, just as we saw not only in Paul's life, we saw in Philip's life and all of the other apostles as we go through the book of Acts. And so, Lord, may we be a church that is operating like the early church in the book of Acts. And may we see people giving their hearts to Jesus. And may we see not only ourselves, but those new converts sharing their faith. So God, help us. We ask it in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said a strong... Amen. Amen. Well, before we dive into that portion of Scripture, I want to just tell you a little roadside story in my own life. Now, I've probably told this story before. Maybe you heard me tell this story, but I want to share it because you and I, we can hear the Holy Spirit and the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit prompts us to move, I want to challenge all of us to take the steps, step out of our comfort zones, and follow what the Spirit of God is saying. Because when we do, we may be in places or positions where God is, has already been working by the Holy Spirit, has already been working on the hearts of those that He is seeking to draw into the kingdom. So, story years ago, I was a young man not that many years ago. I was a young man, and uh, there was a prayer meeting down on the waterfront in uh, southeast Portland. We were praying, and I'd like to, I, I jokingly say I was probably uh, finished in our prayer time. I, I've said that I, I'm just not that spiritual of a guy, I guess, or at least in those days, maybe I wasn't, but uh, we had been praying for a while, lots of people praying, and uh, I, I was kind of done, and I was prompted by the Spirit of God to simply get up and make my way down to the waterfront, the edge where the concrete walkway is and the railing is there before the Willamette River. And as I made my way, I was walking kind of at an angle toward the waterfront and toward the Hawthorne Bridge. And there was a man walking along the waterfront. This was in the evening. It was probably dark and it was about, well, it was dark definitively, but it was probably about seven, eight o'clock. And so it was in the fall. And I was making my way down to the waterfront. And as I realized as he was walking, my path was coming and we were going to intersect as I got. And it would probably have been a little bit awkward for me to be all of a sudden walking right next to this guy on the waterfront. I thought, oh Lord, what are you doing here? Anyway, as I approached him, I was walking a little bit faster. And so as I, as I came to him, I simply said these words, hey bro, Jesus loves you. And this man stopped dead in his tracks, and I kind of kept walking, and then I realized, hey, he's not in my peripheral vision, so I kind of turned around, and I heard him say these words with his head down, standing still, almost as if he was in stride and just stopped dead in his tracks. And he said, what did you say? And I turned back, and I went to him, and I said, I said, hey, bro, Jesus loves you. He didn't look up. The next words I heard were, I can't believe you just said that to me tonight. I said, well, why is that? And he reached into his pocket and he pulled out a knife, sharp object. And he said, I'm on my way to the Hawthorne Bridge to slit my wrists and to jump into the Willamette. I said, bro, God does not want you to do that. And he sent me to you to tell you Jesus loves you. And I was able to share the gospel, how Jesus died and made a covering for sin. And I said, and Jesus brings purpose and hope into people's lives. He's got a plan for your life, and it's good. That man, 
yielded and submitted his will to the will of the Father that night. He gave his heart to Jesus, prayed with me right there on the waterfront, made declaration that Jesus is Lord, that he believed in his heart that God did raise Christ from the dead. And I brought him back and introduced him to some that were there. We got him set up in a hotel that night and made sure that one of our brothers stayed with him and made sure that he was in a safe place. And that man, his name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I say that story to encourage you because in all reality, at the moment when I got up, I may have actually just been in the flesh. I didn't want to pray anymore. And so I got up and I started walking toward the water. And then when I realized our paths were going to cross, I thought, oh, this is going to be awkward. And maybe even in my thinking, I was in the flesh, but I knew what I needed to say. And so I simply said, hey, bro, Jesus loves you. And it was the Spirit of God who then took the whole conversation over. But here's what I want to say. Even though I may have been operating in the flesh, you see, the Spirit of God was working. The Spirit of God was prompting. The Word of God says He orders the footsteps of the righteous. So I may not have even realized where and why I was going, but it, in, in effect, was the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And so, we don't have to be these super hyper spiritual and I'm hearing all this stuff, but let's be ready in season and out because the Spirit of God wants to touch people's lives through you and me, ordinary people with the good news of the gospel of Jesus, sharing the good seed so that life can happen in people's hearts. The seed taking root and springing up and the harvest being made. And so I just, I'm so very excited. We're in this portion of scripture, God-sized conversions, and God wants to use you. You are a seed scatterer. You are a seed waterer. And you are a sickle swinger. You can swing the sickle and bring in the harvest. And so I want to encourage you. I was reminded this past week of a portion of scripture in the book of Revelation talking about our king, King Jesus. And he's sitting on his throne and the Bible says that he has a crown on his head and he has a sickle in his hand. And there's a harvest to be made. Jesus said those very words. You say three months until the harvest. But I say the harvest is white, ready to be reaped. And he said, pray for the laborers to go forth into the field, that there would be laborers. And that's you and that's me. Jesus said, pray. So our prayer is that all of us at Hillside, we would have that sickle in hand, a sack of seed, and we'd be broadcasting. We might have a jug of water on the other side. We're pouring water and we're ready to bring the harvest in. And so let's be ready in season and out. Amen? Amen. Well, let's dive into this portion of scripture. We are in Acts chapter 9. It says this, beginning in verse 1, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And so, bound to Jerusalem. Now, I want to encourage you, let's turn to Acts chapter 26. Flip a few pages, if you will, to the right. Acts 26. And uh, we're going to read a little bit about Paul. Paul now is going to be in front of King Agrippa. And in front of King Agrippa, he is going to be giving testimony. And what Paul does here is absolutely fascinating because King Agrippa is a savvy guy. And he is sharper than attack and he pays attention. And so Paul is going to be making his appeal. And so he says this, we'll pick up because he's talking about his former manner of life, and then some of the things that transpire. So listen, we'll pick up in verse 4. It says, My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, 
all the Jews know. So from a very early age, he's saying, look, I was engaged in all of the right things when it comes to the law, when it comes to the Jews, when it comes to Judaism. And he says, these people know that. They knew me from the first, if they are willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. That's what Paul is saying here. And he says, and now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. He's, he's found a platform. He, man, the law, I'm a, I'm a Pharisee. I'm following. He goes, now I'm standing judged by the promises that had been given to our fathers. And he says, to this promise, our 12 tribes earnestly serving God night and day hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Ju Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead. Now he's, he, now he's preaching to King Agrippa. He says, why, why would this be? He says, indeed, he says, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I must do the exact diametrically opposed to what Jesus was saying. He said, I thought I had to do that which was right, that which was law, that which was opposed to Jesus before he understood that Jesus was Messiah. And he says, this I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them, vehemently against. And so it says, and I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. And so here he is now, Acts chapter 9, and I'm going to reread verses 1 and 2, and that sets the time. He's telling the story of where he was, where his heart was. His heart, this man was a Jew of Jews, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. According to the law, he lived perfect. And he was persecuting because he felt he had to. This was a false religion. It was a, it was a branch off. It was, it was as, you know, another rebellion against Judaism, another rebellion. He thought he was doing God a favor, persecuting and putting to death those that were of the way. Christianity. So Saul, still breathing Threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And Jesus responds, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. So we have some descriptive words here. Trembling and astonished. That might be the understatement of the year. Paul, Saul, on the ground, trembling, astonished. Those that were traveling with him, standing speechless, 
So somewhere along the line, they got up because they had been on the ground and they're hearing this voice and they're they're like, this is a trembling, terrifying moment and yet radically epic. And so it says, then Saul arose from the ground and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him to, into Damascus. And, as he, he, and he was there three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Verse 10. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight. And inquire at the house of Judas, the one called, uh, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Church, hillside, family, brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you. The Spirit of God is moving. The Spirit of God is speaking. The Spirit of God is giving dreams. The Spirit of God is giving visions. And He is guiding and He is directing. And He is orchestrating. And He knows all things. He's the one who enabled Paul to have a dream of one named Ananias who is going to come and lay a hand on him that he might receive a sight. And the Spirit of God is now speaking to Ananias in a vision and saying, go to the street called Straight inquire in Simon's house of a man whose name is Saul of Tarsus. The Spirit of God knows exactly where people are. And he knows the people that you are having influence on. Those that you, that are in your realm of contact. And he's, by his Spirit, working on them, speaking to their hearts, wooing them to Jesus. Oh, that we would hear the voice of the Spirit, that still small voice of the Lord. Listen, the the Spirit of God is not in the wind that peels rocks off the cliffs. He's not in the earthquakes. He's not in the fires. His voice is still and small. Amongst all the noises that are happening in your life and in my life, we must be still and know that he is God and hear the voice of the Spirit so that we can be led by the Spirit. Remember, it's John 16 that says, and it's the Spirit who will tell you things to come. He can only tell you if you're listening and I'm listening. Oh, that we would listen. Spirit of God, speak to our hearts. Speak to our hearts. And so, Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight. You imagine Paul at that moment is like, wait, how did you know that? Jesus was speaking to me also, and he sent me to you. Think about just the confirmation that God is working. God wants to bring confirmations in your life and in my life. I love this. And he says, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he, was, he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Come on. What roadside story is God wanting to do through you? in the life of another human being and their transition from death to life. Folks, let's be ready for these kinds of moments and let's be like Ananias also and be listening to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. So significant. And so, I remind you 
Paul spoke of his pedigree. Paul spoke also to the church in Philippi. He, Philippi, he says, hey, if anyone has anything to boast about, I do. And he goes through this whole litany of the things that he is or was. And he says, and that life I consider rubbish. I think Pastor Matt said it to me this one time as we talked about it, even this last week. He said, Dad, that's like the Greek word. Uh, and, he, and he said what the Greek word is. He's like, it's, it's like the only cuss word in the Bible. <laughs> and I thought that was funny. But it's dung. It's crap. I was fecal matter of an animal. That's what I consider that former way of living. That's what that was for the exceedingly goodness and greatness of the life of God in Christ Jesus. And so, Paul... His disposition was completely transformed and changed. And we could go on in this portion, and I won't read the rest of this, but he immediately preached Christ, verse 20 says, in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Paul went from this vehement disposition and frame of reference from a very young age. That is the only frame of reference he had in relationship to any sect that was pulling away from Judaism. And he was not only getting letters and strongly opposing, he was binding people, bringing them to Jerusalem. And when they were being accused and sentenced, he was casting his vote that they would be stoned and killed. He was there when Stephen was being stoned, giving his approval. A roadside encounter with Jesus. And the very next reality is he is preaching Jesus is the Son of God. He is Messiah. Radical conversion. Testifying Jesus is the way. Confounding people throughout the entirety of the Old Testament that Jesus is Messiah. And so... He said these words, Jesus did, to Paul. And it's a significant portion because something was working in Paul that he was unwilling to bend before his encounter with Jesus. He said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. You may not know what a goad is, but it is a shepherd's tool to keep cattle, oxen, sheep, goats moving. And it's a long stick like a javelin with a metal tip Often, sometimes they just sharpen the end of the stick, but most of the time there would be a metal tip on it similar to an arrow, but it's just a poker. It's like that cattle prod, and they'd use that. And when a beast of burden didn't want to respond, when the goad was poked into him, it would kick its hind legs. I don't know that you could see what I just did, but anyway, he'd kick his hind legs. And in so doing, he would actually create a greater amount of harm and pain to his body. But the shepherd was a greater authority than the cattle or the sheep that he was driving. Directionally pushing them in a safe place for food, a safe place for water, and a safe place for shelter, and a safe place from predators. A greater authority. The phrase kicking against the goad is an unwillingness to submit to a greater authority. And Jesus said, Paul, you have a hard time submitting to a greater authority. And here's the fascinating thing. You see, Acts chapter 26 tells us that when Paul is telling King Agrippa the story, he said, not only did Jesus say these words, but he said these words in Hebrew, in that Hebrew tongue. 
Now, this is fascinating, and I did a little bit of a study on that phrase. That phrase is an ancient Greek phrase that goes all the way back in literature to 450 BC, a familiar and regular colloquialism or cliche, if you will, kicking against the goad unwilling to submit to a greater authority. And Paul was unwilling to submit literally to the God of the universe, thinking that he was already submitting to the God of the universe. And Jesus said, no man, I am Jesus. I am resurrected. I am the Lord. And Paul realized this. He had to die to his flesh. He had to die to his flesh. And this is where I want to direct this morning's message. You see, because you and I need a roadside conversion. We need the seed not to fall on the roadside so that the enemy can snatch the seed away and it has no impact in our lives. The Word of God needs to take up root in our lives. We need a roadside conversion and we need to die to ourselves. It is the Apostle Paul that time and time and time again He said we must mortify the flesh. We must put to death the deeds of the flesh. We must pull off the old self, put on the new self. And you and I, we must heed those words. Mortify the flesh. Mortify. That is put to death the flesh. Now, this is an age-old issue. I I would take us back to Isaac and his wife. She is carrying uh, in her her belly twins and they're stirring on the inside and they're, they're, they're in conflict and she can feel this wrestling going on on the inside as if I know what I'm talking about here. I'm holding like I have a womb and I would even know. But I'm telling you, she knew and there was wrestling going on. And she was praying to the Lord, Lord, what is going on here? And God says something very profound. There are two nations in you. And the older will serve the younger. Listen to this, folks. The profoundness of this. There are two nations in you. The older, the flesh, must be subservient to the spirit. Esau represents the flesh. He's the older. Jacob represents the life of the spirit. And the old, our flesh must submit to the spirit because it is a greater authority. Just like in Paul's life, I must submit to that greater authority. i got to die to my flesh and bring my flesh into subjection. And we see this battle of the flesh from Jacob to Esau. We see it in two kings. Saul, man's king. Give us a king. In an untimely way. So from the tribe of Benjamin, they're given Saul. But David was of the line of Jesse. David was went from the tribe of Judah. The rightful, there are kings in the loins of Judah. David coming from the line of Judah. He would be the real king, God's king. And how interesting. Saul's very first act as king, man's king, king after the flesh, like me ruling over my own life. Saul ruling over the children of Israel, if you will, as man's king. His first assignment was to go and utterly destroy the Amalekites. And the Amalekites are a type of the flesh in the scripture. So Saul, as king and leader over, you are to go and utterly destroy the flesh. And what does he do? He goes in battle against Amalek and the Amalekites, and he does not utterly destroy them. 
He is told to even destroy the beasts. But he comes back from the battle with cattle and sheep. And Amalekites, the king, King Agag, Agag being the title of the kingly Amalekite lineage. He meets Samuel and he says, we have done all that the Lord has instructed. And Samuel stops him in his tracks and says, then what is the bleeding of sheep and the lowing of the cattle that I hear? Let me tell you what God said to me today about you. And the kingdom was taken from Saul because he was disobedient and he did not destroy Amalek, the Amalekites. He did not mortify the flesh. And the kingdom was taken from him. And as a result, as a result of Saul's disobedience, lineage downstream, a man, a man was born 400 years later, almost 500 years later, a man by the name of Haman. You'd know him from the story of the historical book, Esther. Esther, Haman is an Agagite an Amalekite. And the failure to destroy the flesh, the flesh will come back and seek to destroy you in its entirety. Your flesh, my flesh, will seek to bring destruction to me in its entirety. Haman sought not only Mordecai's life, but every Jew in the 127 regions of Ahasuerus' reign as the Persian king. If you and I will not destroy the flesh utterly, the flesh will come back to try and bite us and destroy us. Thanks be to God for David. David, God's king. Saul, man's king, lets the flesh live, doesn't obey. David, God's king. God's appointed king. David had opportunity when he was fleeing during the days of Absalom's rebellion. And David, as he was fleeing, one of Saul's family members, one of the relatives of Kish, Saul's father, a guy by the name of Shimei. Shimei was up on top of a ridge. David and his army was down in the valley. And Shimei was running along and he was cursing David. And he was throwing rocks and kicking dust. And he was just enraged. And Abishai said to David, who is this dead dog? Let me go remove his head from his shoulders. And David said, Abishai, no. No. Maybe the Lord is going to teach me something from this. Maybe the Lord has even instructed Shimei. David had a right, because he was the king, to say, Abishai, go get that dead dog. But he showed grace and mercy. Then later, David, his Absalom dies. David is coming back into Jerusalem. He's crossing over the Jordan. And the very first man that meets him at the crossing of the Jordan, Shimei. And he bows and gets on his knees and says, forgive me. Do spare my life this day. And David said, this is a day of rejoicing. There will be no death on this day. Again, David spares his life grace, mercy, and forgiveness. God's king. Listen, a descendant of Shimei, let's go back now to Esther, Haman, descendant of the Agagites, Amalekite, the flesh, David, God's king, spares grace, love, mercy, forgiveness, spares, and a descendant is Mordecai. Mordecai is of the lineage of Kish through Shimei. Mordecai comes downstream, the hero of the story. And again, we see the flesh and the spirit 
And they're in conflict. But the beauty is the spirit wins when the flesh is submitted. And ultimately, Haman is utterly destroyed. But here's the thing. Haman is destroyed. Mordecai is able to bring destruction to the flesh. But we're told in that narrative, that historical narrative, that Haman had ten sons. And I'm here to tell you that your flesh has arms, if you will, or descendants, sons. And I want to go through the names of the sons because in their Persian translation, they have significance, and you'll see what I'm talking about when I share these names. The ten sons. The first is Par Shemdatha. Parshemdatha, and it means simply busybody. It's self curiosity. I am interested in everybody else's business so that I can talk about everybody else's business but exalting myself above everybody else because far be it from me to behave that way. It's kind of like a David and Nathaniel moment, right? Where I'll accuse someone else, but Nathan says, hey, you're the very guy dealing with that same thing. And that's what a busybody does. Gets in everyone's business, downplaying what they're doing. That's bad, that's bad, that's bad. When in all reality, that's what they're struggling with. That's what my flesh does. That's what your flesh does. It's one of the sons, if you will, of Haman. Okay? The next is Dalphon. Dalphon. Dalphon means weeping self. Self-pity. Pity party. Hey, your flesh wants everybody else to have some kind of pity on you because of your circumstances, what you're going through. And sometimes, woe is me, woe is me, woe is me, woe is me. You know what? That's a work of the flesh. That's a work of the flesh. And we need to get out of our pity parties and find purpose and hope in the Lord Jesus Christ and believe God for his word, stand on his promises, and let him lift us up out of the miry pit, set our feet upon the rock, and make our footsteps firm. Give us purpose. Give us dignity. Give us our identity. Give us our significance. If we're seeking significance from any other place, it's going to be empty. And it'll put us in a place of self-pity. Your significance and my significance comes from what Jesus Christ says about you and me. And he places the value on your life and he places the value on my life. His life was not more valuable than ours. He took our place, died for you, died for me. You have great value. Get yourself out of that self-pity by trusting in what God's word says and leaning there. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding of things. Dalphon must be put to death also. The third one is aspatha. Aspatha means the self, uh, a self-assembly, if you will. Self-assembly. And it really is self-sufficiency. I can do this on my own. Adam thought he could do it on his own. He made a covering for himself and a covering for Eve. It doesn't work. We are not self-sufficient. We are Jesus-sufficient. We are God-sufficient. We are absolutely in need of a Savior. Your goodness is not good enough. If you're listening this morning and you haven't given your heart to Jesus and you think because of your goodness is somehow going to outweigh your badness, there will be no place for you in heaven. Your name must be found written in the Lamb's book of life. Your righteousness, our acts, your acts of righteousness are like filthy rags in the eyes of the Lord. There is none good, no, not one. That's you, that's me. We are not good. Don't lean on your own acts and say, I'm self-sufficient. No, we need a Savior. You are a sinner. You were born into sin, and you have transgression. You've committed your own sin, and you can't make atonement for that. Only Jesus' shed blood upon the cross at Calvary can make atonement for your sin and mine. That's the good news. It's the gospel. And if we will just submit, bring our flesh into subjection to that greater authority, we'll have covering, and our sin will be forgiven, and our names will be written in this book, and we will have the gift of eternal life. Come on. That's good news. We must put to death aspatha. The fourth is paratha. That's 
self-generous, self-indulgence. Hey, man, it's justifying the flesh. Well, I'm better than so-and-so. He does this. I can do this too. Or whatever your justifications are for the sin that you are allowing to continue in your life. No, there's no. We must mortify. We must put to death uh, uh, not only uh, uh, parshandatha, dalphon, aspatha, but portha, uh, poratha, that self-indulgence. And let's submit to the word of God. He said, those who love me obey my commandments, and my commandments are not burdensome. If you're indulging in the flesh, from the flesh you're going to reap destruction. And if you're indulging in the flesh, his commandments are going to be difficult. But if you are indulging in the things of the Lord, following the flesh is going to be difficult. I invite you, let's put to get death that self-indulgence. Uh, Adaliah, self weak self, self-weakness. This, is, this would be like self-consciousness. As a child of God, you are an heir to the king. Co-heirs with Christ. You're a king's kid. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, a people chosen by God. God picked you. Come on. Don't, no, don't be, don't, don't lessen who you are. God told Abraham, I am your exceedingly great reward. You know what you are? You're God's exceedingly great reward. Wrap yourself around that for a moment. You are precious to him. He loves you. Let's not degrade that self-consciousness in less than what you really are. Yes, I'm nothing in the flesh, but I, am, I bear his name now as an adopted child of God. I'm a child of the king. I'm loved. You're loved. Praise God. Number six, Eridatha, self-assertion. That's strong self. That's, that's that arrogant self. We've got to put that arrogance to death. This is my lane on the highway. No, how dare you get in front of me? We've got to kill that. Kill that. Kill that. Let them in. Back off. Use your brakes. Wave them on over. God bless you. Bless them. And lots of examples that we could give there. You understand where I'm going. We need to put to, we need to, put to death, death arrogance. Here's one. <laughs> Number seven. Uh, Parmashta, Parmashta, this is self is king. <laughs> I'm on the throne. I'm on the throne. That's self preeminence. I put myself up. My word above the word of God. That's not what the word of God says. Psalm 132 says he has, he has uh, exalted his word far above his name. We, we must exalt that word. We need to put his word over our word, over our name. Does that make sense? Self-preeminence. We must put to death. Era say I. Self-imprudence is a bold self, right? It's, it's like, uh, just, it's, it's kind of kin to arrogance. It's just boldness. It's, it's forthrightness. It's, it's going places that, it, 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 like when someone's engaged in something, you just butt in. You just get in. You're bold. You just get in there. And you, you'll push your way over someone else's way. It's bullying. It's, there's no place for that in the kingdom. There's no, there's no place for spiritual bullying. There's no, there's no place for bullying, period. We need to put that to death. We need to put that to death. Positionally, you know, if you're over people, let's, let's, let's lead like Jesus led, servant leadership, putting the needs of others over the needs of our own, putting to death that imprudence, if you will, that bold self. Uh, that was Erisiah. There's Eridiah, which is self-pride or uh, superiority complex. We could kill that. I could go on and on and on and on. I, my time's coming to an end. Here's what I'm just saying. The last one is Veazatha, and that is pure self or self-righteousness. 
self-righteous. Oh, dear God, in the kingdom. I think of the Pharisee and the sinner. The Pharisee stood, said, I thank God I'm not like this sinner. And Jesus said in that story, he said, who was justified in the eyes of God? The sinner who bowed, couldn't lift his head. Forgive me, for I am but a sinner. We've got to watch out for self-righteousness. Self-righteousness, the, an arm of the flesh or a descendant of the flesh, these ten sons. Mordecai, Esther, they said, hang, impale the ten sons of Haman. And so they were put to death. And I want you to know something. If we will yield to the Spirit of God, we can put to death our flesh. We see it in the conversion of Paul. Paul went from one thing and he had stock in the flesh. If he had cause for stock of the flesh, if any human being had stock in the flesh, Paul was the guy to have stock in the flesh. That's why he said, I'm a chief of sinners. Because if anybody had it, I had it. You want to talk about boasting? Come to me. I wrote the book on it. He said, I had to submit. And in submission... He found life. If you seek to save your life, if you seek to save the flesh, you will lose your life. But if you lose your life in Jesus, you will actually find life in the Lord. And it will be good. Church, I want to encourage you today to walk with me as we put to death the deeds of the flesh. When you see it, kill it. When you see it, kill it. By the Spirit of God, let's not kick against the goad. Let's listen to and come under that greater authority in our lives. And we can do it. And if you're here listening to this message this morning and you've not yielded to Jesus' extension of love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness, we would invite you to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says if anyone confesses Jesus Christ as Lord with their mouth and believes in their heart that God has raised him from the dead, they will be saved. Their sin will be forgiven. Their names will be written in the Lamb's book of life, and they will have eternal life with God in heaven. And if you make that declaration, you make that decision, you believe in your heart, and you truly believe we want you to be water baptized, we want you to come and let us know so that we can encourage you in your new walk with the Lord. The old is gone, the new has come, and you are a brother or sister in Christ, and we welcome you into the family of God. No matter how old you are, a child all the way up to the oldest of the old, you're welcome into the family of God through your confession and declaration. Well, church, praise God. I know I went a little long this morning. I was very inspired by God's word and the reality of the mortification of the flesh that you and I must do. I want to pray with you this morning that we would put to death the deeds of the flesh and that we would engage in God's kingdom and that we would see roadside conversions bear testimony and witness of people coming to Jesus right now. Father, we love you and we praise you and I thank you for our beautiful fellowship. We thank you, God, for our time of worship. We thank you, God, as our worship team will be coming back in just a moment, leading us in worship, that, God, your name is magnified, that you are glorified in our midst. And, God, will you help us to mortify the deeds of the flesh, putting all of those sons of the flesh, so to speak, in our lives, putting them to death also, that we might seek to gratify the things of the Spirit, and from the Spirit we reap life. God be glorified. We love you and we thank you. And we ask your blessings now in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said a strong amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. Our worship team is coming back. We'll sing this worship song. And then uh, we'll look forward to seeing you very, very soon. God bless. Bye-bye. I walk through the shadow.